Um, okay, so I'm so excited today to have this conversation. Black History Month, we're in our locker room where you all are most comfortable. And I think a lot of people want access to this locker room. And we're gonna have a conversation today. Uh, black History Month, a lot of people always ask about what does black history mean to us as women? Um, I think the direction of this conversation is you as soccer players, but as women of color, black women, mixed women, what is the legacy and history you wanna leave on this earth and the platform you have? And that's what we're just gonna have this conversation with today. Like, who are we? What are we about? Wherever this conversation goes, it's beautiful. It's already beautiful. But um, I think I'm gonna hit it off with, like, just start with the bang. When George Floyd was murdered. Whoa. And, I'm, whoa, I know. Murdered, and I use the word murdered because I'm gonna show up in this conversation real, and I'm gonna go to places that probably are uncomfortable, but this is how we are showing up real. So I remember when he was murdered, I'd just given birth to my daughter, suffered heart failure, trying to figure out life, and I remember I couldn't even get through the video. It was too much. And then the world was like, what are you gonna say about it, right? Like, and for me, my story is, I grew up in Canada where I wasn't white enough. And then I moved to the States and played professionally where I wasn't black enough. I just had this mixed baby. And the world's like, what are you gonna say? And I didn't have my voice. It took me a while to find my voice and I guess I'm opening this up and it's even uncomfortable for me even saying this, but there's a trust that I'm just throwing out there and I'm gonna probably go to you. <laughs> I'm gonna pass the mic to me. Pass okay. the mic to you, like, <laughs> what was that like for you? Yeah, I think for me, you touched on an important part where you said, you know, people were looking to you as to, you know, what are you gonna say? What are you gonna do? And I think that I went through that experience too, where I remember trying to, you know, soak in the events and take in what I just saw last plastered all over, you know, social media. And I remember thinking to myself, like, why is everybody wanting me to do something? You know, I, I think that was the first thought. It was kind of like, you know, everybody was reaching out, like, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? And I remember being like, well, this has always been portrayed as a black person's problem. And to me, I'm like, this isn't our problem. We're the product of racism. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not the the agitators of this. And I think that was when I started, you know, reaching out to a lot of, you know, my black teammates, a lot of um, black players across the league. And I r had great conversations about how ever everyone was experiencing the same thing. They were like, I'm so overwhelmed with so many people asking me what I need to do, what I need to do. And I'm like, yeah, everybody take a breather and, and, and lean on each other in this moment. And you don't have to say anything yet. Right now, this is a moment of, you know, just soaking this in and, and leaning on each other and, and just, you know, going from there. I didn't really know what to do. I was essentially, I just remember the moment of like, okay, I guess I need to watch this video and figure out like, witness part of like what happened. And I started crying just because I was just like, how is this humanity at this point? Like, how are people like, how are these thoughts going through their head? Like, that's appropriate to handle a situation. And then I just kind of had to take a step back and be like, okay, how do I navigate this space that I'm about to be in? Because it's dark, it's reality, it's what we're facing. And then also, like, I had people reaching out to me that didn't even, like, want to experience getting to know me as a person when we were in person, mm -hmm. but then they felt the need that they could reach out to me during this. And I was like, yeah, mm, how are we gonna navigate this now? Mm -hmm. So watching, I couldn't even, I don't even think I watched the entire video because it just broke my heart and I was watching it through a phone. Like I can't imagine mm -hmm. being part of the family and then also being it there trying, like, the people that were witnessing it in front of their own face, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, and not all conversations were negative. I know I had some former teammates reach out, reach out to me that it was two hours of just crying. Mm -hmm. And they're like, whoa, 16 years I've known you, but I feel like I just finally got to see you, you know? 
Did you have any conversations like that, or how did how yeah, did that? Yeah, I mean, I think my first thought was it's yeah, it's inhumane. It's just people finally had proof of what's been happening for I don't even know how long, and I think the reaction of the world was just so long overdue because people are finally seeing it, even though this I mean it's nothing new. It's it's happens all the time, so I think my biggest thing was just the reaction that people had as if this is something that never happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's what stood out to me because people don't understand that this is has been happening for so long and like people are just now it seemed like people are just now figuring it out mm -hmm. and that's I mean that was frustrating for me and then we would come in this team environment and it did feel like we started to have conversations that were long overdue and it mm -hmm. took that to start them um, but just the conversations, it was a lot of like asking the black players, what can we do? What can we do? And it's just like, why, why is it us to tell you what you can do to just be a better person and to treat everyone equally? That's, that's what's frustrating. Powerful. Yeah. Um, definitely after everything happened, like, like you said, it's something that's been going on for so long. So, I mean... It, I guess what's frustrating to me is that, one, it takes it to, like, for it to be on camera, for you to see it yourself, for people to actually, like, be like, oh, okay, maybe there is something maybe going on here, or, and then, like, to turn to black people to speak for all black people and to, and in a way, to kind of force them to facilitate these type of, types of conversations, and then I think, like, I guess where my frustration my frustration was whenever I felt like I had to facilit facilitate the conversation, it wasn't us having a conversation, it was me having to convince you of yeah. why mm -hmm. you should just empathize with with black people and understand what's going on and and that's where like I really just it just really gets me because it's it's just constant of us trying to convince other people of all the suffering that we go through on a daily basis and that for like that for me just brings up so much emotion and it and it kind of blocks me from having having that conversation because I'm just like why am I feeling like I need to defend <laughs> yeah. myself in this like why like why do I why am like why like what <laughs> so it's just <laughs> it's just so mind-blowing to me that um it, it had to get to this point and then even then there was still like questions there was still like well, he was a criminal or like, you know, mm -hmm. he, he did do this and it's just like, what? or he was taking drugs yeah. and it's like, so someone on drugs deserves to be murdered. Is that where mm -hmm. we're going with now? Yeah. It's kind of like exactly the, the what about ism too in mm -hmm. this world is like, has to be put to bed because I feel yeah. like people are, you know, arguing something, but they're so quick to say, well, what about this? What about this? And I'm like, mm -hmm. hold on. This is, the, this is the reality. This man did not deserve to lose his life in that way, regardless if he had just robbed a store. There are ways in which we handle situations like this, and the way he was handled is unacceptable. And that's where people, what people forget, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, like you said, when you have to have these conversations, you feel like you're defending. You always have yeah. to defend. And I think as black people, as black women, we always feel like we have to, you know, one, we don't have a space for ourselves to even mourn. We mm -hmm. don't have a space for us to even be able to take care of ourselves in a sense because we're constantly having to be asked, what do you need, what do you need, what do we do, what do we do? And it's like, can that not be on our shoulders for mm -hmm. once? Can we actually just have this time to, to lean on each other, celebrate ourselves in a way where we can, you know, not have the burden of everybody falling on our shoulders? And I just feel like that was how I felt all of 2020. It was like... I don't even have time to analyze how I feel about this because there's mm -hmm. so many people asking me so many questions on how to solve a problem that, like I said before, is not our problem. We are the result of the problem. And um, I will say not all conversations, like you said, weren't, were bad. Mm -hmm. I think there were a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of my white teammates that understood and they got it and they gave me that space. And I think that was, that was great. But yeah, there were a lot of people that, that did not understand and it was frustrating. And I wouldn't say it, it, you know, surprised me, but I will say when you play on a team and you do have to deal with people who don't 
get it, they don't understand, they don't want to learn, they don't want to educate themselves, it's hard because now I have to almost change how I view uh, people and, and, and it changes how I, you know, step into a locker room. But I think, you know, like I said, there's nothing that has been that surprising. I think black people have always known about these issues and I think now it's time for other people to educate themselves and, and catch themselves up and bring them up to speed. You bring up a good point there, and I'm coming back to you, Yaz, because we talk about the heaviness of it. And I'm going to shift a little bit to the light of it, because we talked about this, how you're from, like, t Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and you show up in Portland, and you're walking around your neighborhood, and you're seeing Black Lives Matter around, and how that connected you to the community, and you're like, whoa, like... This is kind of cool. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Because I think, like, our community, yeah. this is part of us, like, hey, community, hear me, see me. But also, like, when we talked about it, you're like, that was kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so, like, mind-blowing. <laughs> um, yeah, coming from Oklahoma, that was, that's definitely not a thing. And then going to school in Texas, that's for sure not a thing. So coming here and, like, seeing that, like, the complete opposite of what I've had to s been surrounded by, um... I like I just remember like me and Cassius were walking down the street and like I was just like babe did you see that like <laughs> there's black lives matter like it's uh, everywhere like uh, every like window of every restaurant mm -hmm. and store and I'm just like wow like I I felt a sense of like just comfortability and like that I I didn't I don't know like it was it, it's just mind-blowing because I never ever saw any of that from where I had been in the past and like I loved that at least there was some location out there and it gave me a sense of hope that like the mess that message is being mm -hmm. um what's the word just spread in a positive light that black lives do matter and it's and it's being seen everywhere and and worldwide and and that was like really important I was like wow like I love this place this is amazing <laughs> I feel so. like it's so powerful too because you know when I first moved to Portland too I was like this is a predominantly white city. Yeah. I, I'm understanding that. I'm, you know, acknowledging that. But seeing signs, Black Lives Matter, you know, and white supremacy, mm -hmm. like signs like that, I think is so powerful when people who don't look like me mm -hmm. are just as outraged about mm -hmm. what's going on, you know? Because I think, yeah, it's powerful for, you know, black people to get together and say, you know, we're tired of discrimination. Of that course, of course. It affects mm -hmm. us, you know? But I think when you have... You know, people that don't understand what it's like to be in black skin saying, I am just as outraged. I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I know that this is not correct. And this is n absolutely not going to continue mm -hmm. under my belt, you know. And I just think that that's so powerful. And I'm with you on that. When I first, like, moved here, I was like, people care? They don't <laughs> look like me? Like, and I'm okay. Like, that's yeah. great. Like, it's so yeah. it's so powerful. And I always say, like, from the beginning, like, we need white people to stand up to white people in this instance. You know, mm -hmm. we, you know, black people going against white people is just going to cause a race war. You mm -hmm. know, it's just going to keep things even more divided than they've ever been before. And I feel mm -hmm. like we do need people who we can lean on who don't look like us, who are just as outraged. I think you're yeah. talking about allyship, right? Yes. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to jump on that in any way of just like, it's almost like the burden has been lifted a bit right and you find that in the community and then you know like going for coffee like for me i'm a black woman with a mohawk i stick out yes okay but in portland like i go out and they're like hey can we get a picture you know and they're like hey first black gm woo and now i'm like yeah okay let's enjoy this but the importance of allyship especially in this yeah i guess it's just feeling supported and knowing that you're not alone and across the board of uh, the LGBTQIA plus community, like they're looking for allies. The black community is looking for allies. Like it's across the board, like feeling supported and feeling valued and knowing mm -hmm. that your life is important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just like a sense of feeling like you don't have to constantly check your shoulder and be mm -hmm. like, oh, oh, I'm like, I need to be on edge wherever I am, but knowing that you can kind of take a deep breath and relax. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something that took me a long time to come to, even after that year, mm -hmm. because my parents 
I'm so thankful for them, but they sheltered me my entire life. And not knowing a lot of things was just their way of trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming to 22, 2020 and now like we're in 2022, it's crazy how like the blinders are off. Mm -hmm. You are like, I'm an adult in this world and this is what we're facing and allyship is so important. And I think it's some somewhat undervalued and underappreciated mm -hmm. because it's looked past like n just expressing that you're supported mm -hmm. and expressing that you're appreciated for who you are. And I think that's something that people may overlook, but just by having the signs or saying like, you're welcome here mm -hmm. is so important because if someone doesn't feel appreciated or valued or welcome to walk through a door, that that's a hard wall that is gonna be put up. Yeah. And then it's also not gonna be reciprocated. So. Yeah, I, I love Portland too for that reason because I feel like this is a place where it's normal to be not normal. It's like normal to be different. Like mm -hmm. everyone, regardless of race, mm -hmm. can literally be who they want to be. You can be gay. You can be have crazy hair. You like you can walk around Portland and be exactly who you want to be, mm -hmm. and no one looks twice. Mm -hmm. It's just like, hey, like you're cool. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. keep doing you. <laughs> yeah. That's what I love about Portland. It's just, it's just different. And I also grew up in a very very white place. Like, I think my family was one of like five black families. Um, my sisters and I were like one of four black people at high school. My dad was like the black guy in town. Everyone <laughs> knew who he was. I don't know if it's because he's black or because he trains basketball kids, but it was, I mean, it's a completely different world and it's just so cool to be in a place where you just feel like you can just live your life and you're not consciously like being aware that you're one of few people yeah. that look like you. Mm -hmm. Speaking of growing up, so who did we all look up to growing up, right? You talk about your family's basketball. Mm -hmm. Did you have any black female heroes or like who, or she rose? Who, who did you look up to that may have looked like you? I always, I mean, I have two older sisters who also played basketball. My dad played basketball. So basketball is always on TV. Um, and I know my dad just was always talking about Maya Moore, Candace Parker, and mm. they looked just like my sisters and I. So it was just so fun to be like, yeah, they're, that's cool. Like what they're doing <laughs> is cool. They're good. They have swag. Like that's, that's who I want to be. So definitely, you know, more on the basketball side. I, I didn't grow up watching a ton of soccer. Mm -hmm. As I got older, she's sitting right here, the person that. Oh! <laughs> she no. me. I said, I said, I said, you trying to make her cry oh. here? Oh. She's emotional. It's okay. It's not good. I'm emotional again. Yes. Um, yes. No, yeah, Crystal was really the first and only black female soccer player that I'm going to cry. I'm. I'm going to cry, too. Like, I did not know this, and this is news. <laughs> this is news to me, and you know I have a baby inside me, and things are getting weird in there, but... This is... That means... This that is means new. so much, You more than you, like, ever know, because I feel like, especially during Black History Month, people want to ask, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? And, you know, for the first time this year, I really thought, you know, we're a part of Black History. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to, you know pay our respects, obviously, to those that came before us, pave the way for us. But I think it's important that we sit here and we say, no, we are actually the first generation where young black girls are saying, I see yeah. myself in players mm -hmm. now, you know? And I know when I was young, I was like, yeah, I didn't see myself in any, yeah. you know, on any soccer teams. So my, my idol was obviously, you know, Serena Williams because I watched tennis. My parents obviously loved going to the U.S. Open. And, you know, for Serena, she's a dark-skinned woman in a predominantly white sport, and she had to break down so many barriers along the way, and it wasn't easy. The way they treated her, the, you know, the derogatory terms they would call her and say she wasn't pretty, she was too masculine, all this and that, and I was like, no, she is exactly who I want to be because mm -hmm. I know that that is how, unfortunately, the world sees me, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and especially in a sport that 
hasn't always given me that space to feel beautiful, to feel welcomed. And I just think that it's really important that you all realize that that's how I see you guys as, is a part of black history. And I think that that's so important that we shift that mindset because as much as it's important to say, you know, there's so many women and men that came before us, it's important that we realize where we are today, you know, and young girls are really looking up to us and it's, it's incredible and it's probably the main reason why I still play this sport today. It's so beautiful what you said because you have to see it to believe it, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. we were talking before, none of our heroes were black women that were soccer players. Mm -hmm. But now you come to the games and they're screaming your name mm -hmm. and they're like, and so much of it, and that's why this, this conversation is important because they're now hearing you speak their truth, mm -hmm. right? Like Serena Williams, for me, I remember thick black woman, she got ripped apart for yes. what she wore. So that made me think I couldn't wear certain things. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I was like, I'm going to awesomely be myself and it's okay. Portland, let's keep it weird. Let's keep, but it's so important <laughs> that like what you guys, and that's so beautiful. Like, don't feel bad about it. Cause you know, there's going to be a little girl at home yes. right now yeah. being like, I want to be you. Definitely. Yeah. There are. And seeing you now. be open and vulnerable and showing up like that. You I'm just inspired cry. all of us. I so. wanted to stand up and give you a hug. <laughs> oh, no. Too much, too much. <laughs> I mean, I think another thing to bounce off what you're saying, like not only were you the first one that we felt that like the first kind of representation, I guess, but like it wasn't just, you know, I, I felt like growing up, like especially like black females, like we were only, people were only looking at us for ath athleticism. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you really stepped, like when you stepped up to the table, it was like, no, like, black, just because she's black doesn't mean she just has to run past everybody, like, mm -hmm. or that she's the forward that, you know, there's just going to run yeah. past. Like, you have to, you, obviously, technical, tactical, just yeah. brilliance. And it's just, like, I think for me, like, that was where, like, I was, like, okay, like, I can be a midfielder if I want yes. to. I can be that crafty person. I don't have to be the one that's just the strong and fast, and that's kind of all I, that's yeah. really mm -hmm. to it. Um, and I felt like a lot of... Um, black female soccer players in particular were that was really all that they were looking to to be used for and like that was really all coaches saw or wanted from them and um yeah it's just yeah it's important that like you know like anybody can be that crafty player in the midfield anybody can be that outside back that just you know is is also a playmaker just mm -hmm. any you can be any position any any part of the game that you want to be um and not just seen for your athletic ability. Yeah. And so I thought that, like that was something that was huge. Like it was like, oh my gosh. Like, I just think yes. it's so important because I feel like the way we are stereotyped on the field is the exact way we are stereotyped in society. And I think it's important, you know, when I speak to young black kids, I always tell them, you know, don't let anyone put you in a box because the way they describe you, if they say you're only fast, athletic, strong, those are the same traits that off the field, they're in and say you're a threat. And this is why you have unarmed black people being shot mm -hmm. because they see you and they say, that person must be dangerous. They must be strong. They must be, you know, threatening. And I feel like in sports, especially soccer, we need to be athletic. You, everyone needs to be athletic. Right. It's not just black people who play this soccer, this sport exactly. need to be athletic. It's like, you better be able to haul down, yeah, up and down that field, of, you know, regardless of what you look like. But I feel like it's so important that from a young age, kids are taught you're more than what what people just see you as, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think coach, it's, coaches have a responsibility to train and develop a player, not based on what they think this player is going to be, but what right. they can be. Mm -hmm. And it's so important. And anyone who I know who's a coach, I'm always saying, you better make sure that when you are coaching any minorities, you let them know that because it's easy for them to just say, oh, I think I'm only just fast, so like I'll just train that and get really good at that. And it's like... You could be so much more than that, and it's so yeah. important. So yeah. it's also yeah. crazy that it's they people are trying to fit kids just in these boxes of just being athletic. But it's even off the field, you can be really smart and yes. bring so much to the table. You can be an athlete, but you can also be a good student. You can be a good human. Like mm -hmm. you can bring your whole self to this table. Like you don't have to just be an athlete and m make that your way through getting through this world mm -hmm. yeah because that's this box that black kids are known of just that's how they navigate life yeah. is 
you have to make it in the NBA, the NFL, in track, like, because you're athletic. And that's it. And that's all that they're looked at. Mm -hmm. And, like, there's so many great human beings out there that are more than just athletes. And I think this table itself speaks to that because Crystal's a great human being. She's been able to adapt her game, but also, like, the stuff she does off the field. And I think that speaks to everybody because we're just looked at as just athletes and soccer players. But if people open their eyes a little bit more, like, we are more than just athletes. Yes. We're also human beings, and we have other passions as well, but we're also very smart Mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. Like, we're human, and I think that what we need to also like allow people to grow and appreciate the space of like education still super important and not just relying just on athleticism yes no it's valid for what you're saying i think um let me ask a question so we have a couple mixed people do you i'm gonna go around do you want to be called mixed do you want to be called black i am i'm black but i'm also mixed so I'm indifferent because I don't want to just exclude my mom because my mom's a huge part of my life. Mm-hmm. My mom's white, my dad's black. Yeah. So the society call like if you are out in public, they're just gonna say you're black. Mm-hmm. You fit this one box. But then when some people look at you, you're also like, but you're not fully black. Mm-hmm. And so there's like that hesitation. I'm indifferent on, I am black, but I'm also mixed, so. I think I would agree, mixed and black, but I like, I'm just thinking about like some like the forms we have to fill out sometimes. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. you're, I don't even, it's Hispanic, black, Caucasian, like you Asian, can, you yeah. can I check other, them all. I'm like, Native American. there's other, <laughs> like, there's like all. online, it's like, mm-hmm. you can pick one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or you could write other. That and is it's like, probably going to go away very soon. I feel like it nowadays, to. I mean, yeah. it's going to have but to go away. But it hasn't. I know. And like, what I like think of that when I'm like, how do I want to be addressed? Because I don't, I don't even know. Because I never have had the option. Yeah. Ooh. To yeah. say, yeah. To You've say ne- you haven't had the option to acknowledge who you are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You? Yeah. So, kind of going off that real quick, I remember my older sister. She was in fifth grade, I think and she was super young and I remember she was filling out the forms and we were raised by my mom and my mom is white so yeah but so we like (laughs) anytime we would get a form in elementary school I remember specifically my sister did this she would mark white and they would come back and correct her because of that physical appearance just because she doesn't look white like you you can't be white that's not that's not the box you need to check if it's one it's it's black and I just remember that being like a whole ordeal because my mom was like, she is just as much black as she is white. Like, just because she has that, like, wow. what? Like, are you kidding? Um, but yeah. I think for me, like, I definitely, I, like, I'm mixed for sure. Like, I am 50% white, 50% black. And so, um, but at the same time, I also go in this kind of mode when years like 2020 kind of happen. I'm like, I really want to channel my black side. Like, I really want to, I guess, really embrace that part just because of, one, just just hoping to break stereotypes of what a black woman should, could, or would look like. And then also just, like, I don't know. Like, I, I almost sometimes feel like a sense of, like, like a duty to, like, represent just this one side. Yeah. Um because of everything that's happened and but at the same time I also don't think that's really fair that that if you are in that spot that you kind of have to choose um between being black or white and so I I would prefer I I would like for people to know that I am half and half um however because of you know where we're at today and and just society and my physical appearance I like black is all that people see I asked this question very personally so I have a mixed race child you're about to have him. And I remember having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> having a, I won the lottery with my in-laws. But, like, my, my husband, high school sweetheart. And I remember when, after George Floyd was murdered, we had this conversation, and they're like, oh, I've never seen you. I've, I've never seen color. 
And I wasn't brave enough and I maybe hadn't gone through the process in my mind to be like, I want you to see color. But I remember when we were pregnant, mm -hmm. I actually said, and I remember my mother-in-law cried so hard that day. I said, I wonder what tone she will come out as. And as a family, they were like, what? I can't believe you have to think about that. And I was like, is she gonna be darker or lighter? Because it might affect her life, which is yes. heavy. And um, I know we've had like the conversations you need to have and have, and that's why I'm listening to everything you're saying. I'm like, okay, because this is what my daughter's gonna have to go through, mm -hmm. that identity. How does that make you feel knowing that, like in that little one right there? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, I feel like I learned so much from all of my friends who are mixed because I am going to be in a situation where I'm going to be the parent of a mixed child. And, you know, as a parent, you want to protect your child. You want to set them up for life. You want them to feel as comfortable in their skin as, as you know, you have been able to grow into. And, you know, I have to obviously accept that my child is going to go through a different experience than I went through. You know, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, his skin might be a little bit lighter. He is going to be mixed. And I think um, some days I actually question, like, will I be able to give him what he needs? Because I know for me, like, I've, you know, I don't fit multiple boxes. Like, to me, I'm a black girl, like a black woman who looks black, who people know is black. Like, there's no hiding it. There's no way that I don't fit that description. And I think, um, you know, the, the common experience that I feel like I've heard around, um, you know, people who are mixed is they don't know where they fit, they fit. And I feel like I've thought about this more and more as I get closer to my delivery day of like, I don't want my child to say that they don't know or where they fit in or they, they you know, the kids at school don't call them, don't accept them because they're not black enough or white enough. And I think that it's just going to take me always having conversations with my lovely, mixed, beautiful women <laughs> up in here. <laughs> but just knowing that, you know what? <clears throat> People are gonna say what they want. I think I've got, as I've gotten older, I've realized you can prepare as much as you want, mm -hmm. but you can't always change what's in people's heart. And I think as a parent, I'm gonna try and set my child up for the best start to his life. But at the same time, he's gonna go off to school. He's gonna be exposed to, to kids who are not gonna be maybe so nice to him. and. I think it's just my job to always instill that confidence in, in him and just let him know, like, you are exactly who you need to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have two loving parents who, you know, have their own experiences. But at the end of the day, like, love is all that this kid needs and support. And mm -hmm. I feel like if I just pour all of that into him, then I think, you know, I can't go wrong. But I think at the end of the day, it is going to be it is going to be a challenge. Just listening mm -hmm. to you all stories, I feel like, you know, it like breaks my heart in a sense because I think especially as black people, we pin ourselves up against each other. You know, for me having darker skin, there's a lot of friends who I know who are my skin complexion who aren't that nice to mix people because they're like, well, you're not, they're, they're not really like us. Like they don't mm -hmm. go through the same thing that we go through. They don't, their skin isn't as dark. They don't probably face as much, you know, racism or discrimination. And I'm like, you know what, but they, one, we're not a monolith, so regardless of people's experiences, all black people are not the same. Yeah. We go through different things. But it doesn't mean that my life's any more challenging or different than yours. You have your own challenges, I have my own challenges, and right. I think what's important is that we listen to each other and we learn, because like I said, I'm giving birth to a, a mixed child, and there's gonna be things that I don't know or understand, and that's when it comes down to me just educating myself and, and asking questions and you know yeah. just learning from everybody. I think one of the things, and this is the whole point of this conversation, is to think of ourselves as legacy leavers, mm -hmm. right? And when we, I remember my dad growing up said to me, make sure the fact that you're a black woman is not two strikes against you. And it shifted me from the shy kid to like, I'm going to walk in the room and let you know who I am immediately. I'm not going to let you judge me or whatever. And then coming to the idea of like, who I am as a human being, is different on this year, earth. I bring something unique. I have a greatness about me. You have a greatness. We all do. So when we start to think of legacy leavers, right, obviously already doing that, <laughs> the young girl who's going to be watching this at home, or maybe it's the white man who's watching this at home. There's a lot of them. There? Yeah. <laughs> What? Sorry. Oh, there you go. And she does it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, there's nothing wrong right there. with that. 
When I say legacy <laughs> leavers, and I put in the fact that you are black woman or mixed woman, black, white, what hits home for you? Because when we grew up, clearly we didn't have us to look up to. We're rewriting history in its own way, not just as soccer players, but as women, as human beings. This discussion al already, it's been uncomfortable, but it's been so comfortable, right? We've been raw, we've been real, we've laughed, we've cried. But <laughs> now it's talking about the impact we want to have in this world. And this conversation, even if it hits one person, we've won. I mean, it's hit us, so we're already winning. But when I say legacy leavers, I want to start with you. Oh gosh, okay. This is a great question. I think for me, like, what I think about every day, not that I am on my way out, y'all, but I'm just <laughs> saying as I progress through my career, I think what I've thought most about, you know, what I want to leave this game is just, you know, letting young black girls know that they're beautiful, they're supported, they're loved, and that they matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, it's, it's something that I think about constantly because I just think being a young black kid is hard. People don't understand how hard it is. It's like they don't have the, 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 the leisure of just waking up and saying, oh, I can play freely in the street and nothing's going to happen. It's like black kids have fears that, that their counterparts don't understand. And I think if I can relieve any bit of pressure, any bit of burden that young black kids feel and just, you know, let them know that they are beautiful, they are so important, that they matter, they're unique, they're creative, they're talented, all of these traits that I don't feel like they're told throughout their upbringing. I feel like they're told, you know, hey, you better, you better, like you said, you better play a sport because that's all you'll ever be. You better do this because that's the only way that you'll be seen. And it's kind of like, kids just need to be kids. And unfortunately, minority kids don't get to be kids. And I feel like anytime I, I speak to the youth, the youth, I just want them to know like, you deserve to be a kid. You deserve to feel loved and supported and told that you matter, told that you can be great. And if you can give them the best start to their life, the sky is the limit. But the issue is at a young age, they're told that they don't matter or they're, they're shown that they don't matter. And then that is how we get into this cycle. And, and that is how 2020 happens. And we are still fighting these battles of letting people know that black lives matter. So I think just, you know, telling young kids from an early age that they should just be kids and they should be loved and, and you know, just shown the way in, at, at such a young age, I think um, is really important. Well, I just, going off of that and like adding to it, just the value and appreciation for kids that you have representation for just growing up, like you can be in this game and you can be a star for who you are. Like, you don't have to just be an athlete. You can adapt your game and also just know that we're here to support you, like, no matter what. And I think that's something that, like, I go home and I'm super grateful for the gym that I go to, the McLarens, because they're a mixed family and they, I keep in, I literally talk to them today and I love the girls. They're young and they play soccer and they play tennis and they love it and they're able to be kids. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that every day. And I think that's something that showing them that you do have representation and you're able to also like be in school and use your brain and show people that you're more than just an athlete. This is a game, but at the same time, like you bring so much to the table. So. Beautiful. Yeah, I would definitely hope to kind of sp I guess to spread the idea everything that they said for sure but also that you don't have to be an athlete to or, or get to a certain point as an athlete to have influence on those around you or or I guess I don't know like you don't you don't even have to go the sport route like you can do anything literally anything that you are passionate about that you want to do that you love and you can do it to the like to the fullest and to the best of your ability and don't let anybody tell you differently and that's really just what I hope is that 
all kids know that like they really like can be anybody and you don't you don't have to be the top athlete you don't have to be you know the president you don't have to be in all these big spots to to kind of fulfill whatever it is that you want to fulfill or, or even have influence um, on anybody so <laughs> that's really I guess what what hits home for me well I think us just being here right now and also being here with Portland playing soccer is already kind of leaving a legacy because kids are watching us already um, and even if it's not little girls, little boys who want to play soccer, if they just can turn on the TV and see a black person doing something, mm -hmm. like that's enough for them to say, okay, I can do something too. Like I can, I can like you said, I can be literally whatever I want to be. Um, I think I'm gonna talk personally about my boyfriend. He's mixed too. Um, and I just think it's so cool because he's at Stanford. Um, he's so smart, like super smart. And he's all he plays football, but he's always talking about I can be so much more than that. Mm -hmm. If the NFL doesn't work out for me, who cares? Like mm -hmm. that's I'm just I'm more than that. I'm more than football. I'm a really freaking good athlete, but like I can do cool things in life that has nothing to do with sports. So that's like that's what I think of. I think people like that are so important mm -hmm. for little kids to be like, okay, like I don't yeah. I can play sports, but that's not it. Uh, if I don't want to play sports at all, I'm not going to. No one can make me just because I'm black. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm freaking athletic, like, yeah. I don't have to. I don't have to do that. You can do, like you said, literally whatever you want. Yeah. Be whatever you want. Have big goals. Have big dreams. And I think just understanding that nobody or nothing can stand in the way of that as long as kids believe in themselves. And I think it's on us to instill that belief in them mm -hmm. um, and doing that in whatever ways that we can. Well, we'll just drop the mic there. I think what you all will notice, is I remember being your age, as you reminded me many years ago. <laughs> 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 but well, this game is a platform for each and every one of you. Who you go on to be, this will just be the beginning. And the legacy you are already leaving. Like you said, just by being in this club. I mean, I remember playing, but now it's like, it's the same things that you say, we say to the kids, like dream big, be who you want to be, own who you are. And I've enjoyed this conversation. I think other people will enjoy it too. So if not you, then who, if not now, then when? Oh, whoa, Dang. okay. Boom. Were you planning well, righty? No, I just, <laughs> yeah. Wow. But yeah. honestly, I think, I think <laughs> this conversation, I'm looking into the camera to the people at home because I hope you understand how raw, authentic, and real, and hard this conversation was. But the reason we had it is we do want to be legacy leavers. We do want to impact, but it's not up to us. It's up to you. Bye.